what I'd said about Pauline Hanson. And I got a call from the Prime Minister quite near question time. I had the phone out here and could still hear clearly what he was saying. He was clearly agitated and tense and angry. We must absolutely reject old-fashioned, racist, elitist attitudes. I made a speech attacking Pauline Hanson pretty vehemently. I think I'm right in saying this. In nearly 12 years as the foreign minister, I think it's pretty much the only time he's rung me to chastise me, but he wasn't too impressed with it because he said, well, you know, it's just going to leave me out there and people are going to say, well, you know, the media are going to say, well, Downer's doing the right thing, why doesn't Howard? Among initial coverage, some strong editorial alarm bells. The Pauline Hansen saga continues. Eight billion dollars a year in export earnings have been jeopardised by the race debate. A growing backlash in the Asian media left the Prime Minister unmoved. I, I think in a few months' time, people are going to look back and say, uh, what was that all about? There were a few cables that came in from overseas from predictable sources saying, um, this is dreadful and it's, you know, it's getting some media coverage. You know, I made it my business to ensure that, you know, Graham Morris saw bundles of cables, bundles of press reports. But when you actually talked to Asian leaders or when you actually looked at what was going on, it was just a few bureaucrats cutting out newspapers with, saying, you know, this is shock horror, it's destroying Australians' reputation. Rubbish. The reaction in Southeast Asia uh, was really quite adverse, strongly adverse, to the statements that were being made by, uh, by Pauline Hanson. So it's not just possible to dismiss those diplomatic cables, to dismiss the, the press reports. The Prime Minister has made his strongest attack yet on independent MP Pauline Hanson's anti-Asian stand. Seven months after Pauline Hanson's maiden speech, John Howard finally shifted strategy, speaking out against her. She is wrong when she says that Australia is in danger of being swamped by Asians. She is wrong to seek scapegoats for society's problems. And after he'd made the statement, Graham, Graham Morris came across the room and I was at a separate table and he said, are you satisfied now, Philip? Are you happy now? And I said to him, it was an excellent statement, but it was seven months too late. So what sort of a budget will it be? Uh, well, it will be a strong, fair, tough, strong and fair. Costello certainly isn't playing down his first budget. If we don't do the hard yards now, the problems are going to get worse. If gun laws and Pauline Hanson had strained John Howard's bond with the battlers, ah, there's a place I know. his government's first budget was about to alienate many others. It's a good balance, that's an excellent yeah. The 1996 budget was both praised and pilloried. There were drastic cuts to universities and labour market programs. The public service was downsized and the Commonwealth Employment Service was privatised. The day before the budget, uh, there was a riot on Parliament House. The Commonwealth Police locked me in my office um, to protest about the balancing of the budget. I knew what was in the budget and I thought to myself, if they're, uh, they're rioting before they've seen it, imagine what they'll be doing after they've seen it. The budgets of the ABC and the Office of the Status of Women were cut. Indigenous Affairs also felt the razor. Funding for ATSIC was slashed. These sort of cuts are defensible, they are fair, they do not decimate Aboriginal funding. They do not represent it some kind of financial genocide as, uh, genocide as one person alleged. And I think the whole debate should just simmer down. But relations between the Aboriginal community and the Prime Minister were about to boil over. There was a lot of suspicion uh, within the uh, Aboriginal communities about 
what we might do with native title. Native title had been of huge symbolic importance to Aboriginal people. Then, on the 23rd of December 1996, the High Court recognised the Wick people's native title rights. That is the Christmas present I'll take to the Wick people. But there was no celebration at Kirribilli House when John Howard heard the news. The WIC decision established native title could coexist with a pastoral lease. It, it sent shockwaves through, uh, you know, the government and the legal system entirely because so much of Australia uh, is covered by pastoral leases. Now, that was a very difficult period and uh, I tried very hard to reach an accommodation between the various groups. Farmers and miners, fearful they would lose their land, were outraged. We deserve our own land rights and we prefer total extinguishment. And we feel that they've just let us down and they've been actually treacherous. To appease them, the Prime Minister's solution, a ten-point plan aimed at watering down the Native Title Act. You know, they were suddenly up in arms about what does all this mean. So it, it, it uh, really, you know, was, the, was the, the cat in the hen house. In May 1997, John Howard and his deputy went to Longreach in Queensland's Central West to explain the Prime Minister's plan. They encountered a furious mob. Ladies and gentlemen, I also recognise that uh, there are no simple uh, solutions. I remember walking up those steps with John Howard and others, and uh, you know when a crowd is smouldering and ready to uh, belt you up. Please don't believe this fear-mongering that says native title claimants can throw you off, throw you off your property. They can't. We will never, ever allow that to happen. Well, I certainly felt that the pendulum had to come back uh, somewhat towards the pastoralist and uh, minor side, and uh, particularly given that our working assumption until the High Court decision had been that the grant of a pastoral lease extinguished native title to say that Indigenous people's rights uh, can be extinguished and obliterated and never re return uh, by a government led by Howard was not going to help uh, bridge any gaps. Can I say how very pleased I am to be here today to formally open this convention? Nine days after the Longreach meeting, John Howard travelled to Melbourne for the Aboriginal Reconciliation Convention. Like the farmers, this audience had deep concern about the government's response to the WIC decision. The Prime Minister's speech began in a conciliatory tone. Personally, I feel deep sorrow for those of my fellow Australians who suffered injustices under the practices of past generations towards Indigenous people. Equally, I am sorry for the hurt and trauma many people here today. The applause soon exploded into anger when the Prime Minister justified his ten-point plan. I also need to, in the name of truth and the name of a frank discussion of this issue, to repudiate the claim that my ten-point plan plan involves a massive handout of freehold title at taxpayer expense. That is an absolute myth. It is absolutely contrary to the fact and I absolutely repudiate it. So, so ladies and gentlemen, I believe... It, it was awful footage. He looked as if he was under pressure and he was. Um, you know, he was being heckled. He was trying to be heard above the din. Uh, he was shouting. Uh, they were shunning him. It was supposed to be a moment of reconciliation and it turned into a, a moment really of division. I, I probably shouldn't have reacted as energetically as I did and it would have made for better television. I have great pleasure in formally declaring this convention open. Thank you. I tried to reassure him that, uh, you know, we've still got a great process. Uh, that we, uh, we have to arise above the differences that we've got if we're going to heal this nation in any serious way. He wasn't interested in that. And in fact, I walked him back off the stage at the end of the proceedings 